All right, guys, so it's really rare to see me on camera for an episode commentary video. In fact, I think the only other time I was on camera was the initial episode commentary that I did for the pilot, which was like two years ago or something. It was a long time ago. Um, maybe one year ago, year and a half, two years, I don't know. Anyways. I, the reason I'm on here today is because I just had to share something with you. Um, it was, you were really close to like never getting the episode commentary that you're about to watch for Deadly Nightshade. Um, I'm pretty sure that episode is haunted or, you know, there's some mystery around it. And here's why. I had to record this stupid commentary three times. Not once, not twice, but three times. In all of the commentaries I've done... I don't think I've ever had to redo um, all of it. Maybe just little pieces here and there, but not all of it. So uh, the first time I did it, I went through the whole thing, did a decent job, I thought. Went to load it in to edit it, and it only recorded like the first half of it. And the second half is just gone into oblivion. So I'm like... Okay, so I stepped away from a couple days for a couple days because, you know, whenever you you talk about these details um, and point out all this stuff and try and have some enthusiasm around it, it's hard to like redo that and recapture it. I kind of feel like probably how a lot of actors feel when they're you know they they do a performance and then they're asked to do it again. I'm not an actor, but that's probably how they felt. So I stepped away from a couple day for a couple days, and. Uh, did it again. All right, so I did the second time, and uh, I only I re-recorded the second half, because the first half I had, or no, not the first half, like 12 minutes of it I had. So then I picked up where I left off and continued it, even though that's not best for flow and different things like that. I thought, well, I don't wanna have to re-record the first half. So, um, turns out the second time I recorded it, uh, I got video, but no audio. So that's great. Um, Yes, so I was really frustrated at that point, and I was wondering if anybody would even notice if I, you know, just skipped Deadly Nightshade. But then I thought, well, I probably shouldn't, right? Nobody likes an incomplete set. Um, so I waited a couple more days, punched a hole in the drywall, and started over again. And this time I decided just to redo the whole thing, right? Because at this point, it wasn't going to sound right if I just, you know, tried to finish it. So I started completely over. So this time it all worked. Everything recorded. Everything was good. And actually, um, in retrospect, I think this third one is probably the best out of the three. I picked up on a few additional details that I didn't cover in the earlier versions. So maybe this was a good thing this happened. But... Um, all I've got to say is I, you guys better appreciate this episode because it drove me crazy. All right, so that's about all you need to know about that. So um, let's go ahead and dig into Deadly Nightshade. Hello all you fine folks out there in Knight Rider land. We're back with another episode commentary, Deadly Nightshade. Not really a bad episode if you uh, think about it, all things considered. But um, we're going to start this commentary off just slightly different because we've got a handful of behind the scenes candid photos from this episode that uh, we found on eBay years ago. Bought them and then digitally scanned them. So I thought, why don't we start by showing you some behind the scenes shots of this episode. All right, so we'll start with this. We've got the ski mode, right, from later on in the episode. This is in fact the final ski mode of the series, right here. Um, there we go. We've got 
two of the kit cars here, one of the Universe Studios vans that we saw way back in the pilot. Actually, three kit cars. There's one parked back there. This is the right-hand blind drive car on the left. You can see the shroud there. And this is the hero car right there. What else? Hasselhoff talking on his modern cell phone. We've got uh, Hasselhoff and uh, Edward Mulhair. Another Hasselhoff Mulhair picture. Another one. Nice photo of Edward looking at the camera. All right, so here we've got um, three kit cars and one of the Universe Studios Comtron crew transports. All right, so what can we see here? Um, this is the hardtop stunt car that we've had since season one in the foreground. This next car, boy, it's really hard to tell with the shadows. It's either the left hand or the right. No, it's not the, it's not the uh, right hand. I think this is the left hand blind drive car because you can see the round steering wheel and you can see it just got a new windshield they have taped in. This car in the very back here is the very rarely seen insert car for season four and you can't really tell because of the shadows here but there is gold trim on the bottom of this car right here and the outside wasn't completely a stock trans am but it was close but you can see it was a 1984 model but it does have 1982 um turbo casts on it so there you go another picture of Hasselhoff talking on his cell phone um, another angle of the the uh, ski mode it's blurry as you can see but still nonetheless close-up of Hasselhoff contemplating his life after Knight Rider since he only had a few more episodes to film and um, there's Kit again being driven there's the uh, Canada shot of the actress who uh, you know was talking to Kit another shot of Hasselhoff another shot of Hasselhoff and Mulhair so this shot was always interesting to me. <clears throat> do you think that's Catherine Hickland? I kind of do. Wearing a black wig, maybe? But look at that face. That really looks like Catherine Hickland. And it very well could be, right? I mean, they were husband and wife during this time. I'm sure she stopped by the set. That's probably who that is. With a Comtron vehicle in the background. Another shot of Hasselhoff. And uh, this kind of cool shot doing the ski mode at night. Obviously, this was a rehearsal, right? This wasn't the actual filmed one. And another one of Hasselhoff and Mulhair. Hasselhoff and Mulhair. And then finally, a great shot of the left-hand blind drive car, the inside of it. So what can we see here? Um, as I've stated before, the left-hand blind drive car had the Season 2 Hero Dash put in it after... Um, they didn't, you know, after they redid this, the hero car for season three. So we've got this telescoping round stunt wheel. We've got a little bracket here holding a light, which is the brake line lock light. So when the brake line lock was on, this light would engage. So the stunt driver would know. We see the center console is taped shut. We've got a very tall handled shifter so they could reach it from the back seat. This little guy here, it's hard to see, but this is actually the factory headlight switch for the Trans Am so they can control the headlights. And uh, I'm not sure what that is right there. All right, there you go. Now it's time to really dig into Deadly Night Shade. And a night rider, an evil magician wants Michael to disappear permanently. Right. Production 60229, Deadly Nightshade. This episode was written by Philip John Taylor and directed by Sidney Ayers. It originally aired on NBC January 24th, 1986. That was a Friday night at 8 p.m. It was filmed from December 3rd through the 11th of 1985. It was the 77th episode to air, but the 78th to be produced. Uh, the synopsis reads as follows. Michael and Kit enter the spectacular world of magic when the prime suspect for the murder of a foundation trustee is a magician who has a talent for being in two places at one time with deadly consequences. How do you like that synopsis? I wrote that myself. All right, so um, this episode, of course, features the famous magician Lance Burton. Right, Lance has had a show um, in Las Vegas for many, many, many years. In fact, he was doing a show at the Tropicana Hotel in Vegas whenever um, he was getting ready to shoot this episode. And we talked to him back in 2012 about his experience on the show. 
and uh, how amazing it was. Some of the input he gave um, into the the magic of the episode. Even simple things like, do you remember the scene where uh, uh, Templeton is pulling out the red handkerchiefs from, from thin air and then he pulls them out of Michael's jacket? Originally, that wasn't going to be the case. He was just going to pull them out of a pipe or something like that. But he wanted... Um, Lance Burton wanted to, you know, add those pieces it in, and the director Sidney Ayers was very open to Lance's idea. So a lot of the magic you see is something that Lance worked into the episode it's himself. Now I've never talked about this on this channel in all of the videos and all of the years we've been doing this, but um, a lot of the information that I provide in these episode commentaries, um, including the full interview with Lance Burton can all be found in a book I wrote back in 2012 called Knight Rider, 30 Years of a Lone Crusader and His Talking Car. Um, I highly recommend you check it out. It is jam-packed with um, trivia, behind-the-scenes, cast and crew interviews, behind-the-scenes photos. It's We really put a lot of work into this book back in... Um, 2012. And, um, you know, in all these episode commentaries, I give you trivia and behind the scenes stuff. A lot of it is in the book, but there's a lot more in the book that we didn't even cover on these episode commentaries. So if you're interested, the book is still available from Amazon and there's a link in the description down below. You really should check it out. All right, let's uh, move on. All right. Yeah. So here's uh, Austin Templeton played by Lance Burton. One other thing I wanted to point out is, um, after the episode aired, Lance was trying to pitch an idea for Austin Temple to come back, come back in season five. But um, he was planning on calling one of the producers, Bert Armas, to pitch him an idea. Uh, he said Templeton could be brought back next season to take revenge on the man and the car that put him away. But unfortunately, the show was canceled and he never got to do that. So I don't have a screenshot here. This one will do, I suppose. So shortly after this scene, there's a scene where Austin brings in his table of death, right? The the table with the spikes that fall on it. Um, interestingly enough, that piece of equipment was rented from another magician. And the production notes at the time state that the table of death was damaged when it rolled off the stage, tumbled down, and destroyed an audience, one of these audience tables and glassware. Now, there wasn't anyone injured. There weren't any people there. But that table of death rolled down, fell off the edge, and probably broke like this table right here. Um, so I'm showing you it on this screenshot because this is a great one to show you kind of the layout of the, the um, place itself. Um, most of this episode was filmed at the Ambassador Hotel on Wilshire Boulevard in California. I'm pretty sure the Ambassador Hotel is no longer, but most of the interior of this episode was not filmed at the hotel. It was actually filmed at the Pasadena Playhouse, which is still around, including the whole scene with the dressing rooms later on where the tiger attacks them. All that was filmed at the Pasadena Playhouse. All right, so here we have the left-hand blind drive car. This is one of my favorite... I, I love this shot, right? You see Kit just there... Uh, Michael calls him, he activates, pops the lights on, and then takes off, has a great rumble to the engine. You look closely, you can see the stunt guy's nose right there and a little bit of his face coming through. Um, for those of you curious about the cars used in this episode, there were one, two, three, four, five, six Trans Ams used in the filming of this episode. And they are, of course, the left-hand blind drive car here, the hero car, season three and four hero car, the right-hand blind drive car, the hardtop stunt car, the same one we've had since season one, the general purpose T-top stunt car that's been around since the beginning of season three, of course the season four insert car, and I guess that's it. Um, now of course Kit does go into super pursuit mode in this car, um, or in this episode, but all of it was reused footage from uh, night behind bars. So technically they didn't even use that car in this episode. It was all reused footage. So six Trans Ams use this kit in this episode. And this is one of the best looks you get. This is the left-hand blind drive car. Um, and you saw in our behind the scenes photos at the beginning of this episode, the hero dash, but they're clear as day. You can see the two TV dash um, in this scene where Kit's self-driving. 
And you can see the nice big bulge right here behind the seat. And it looks like there's no speaker cover right here. It looks like that's all cut open. All right, so now we're in the semi with Dr. Browning here. And um, once again, you know, this is normally where the the cabinets would be, the, the wall unit, the oak wall unit in the semi. But of course, they're filming from this angle. This whole wall has been removed. And you can see they just set up the computer here on this little plywood table, right? That's not at all what it would look like. But um, again, we're not supposed to see that angle. In this episode, they talk about how Dr. Browning helped develop some of Kit's systems. And I thought, wasn't it just, you know, like two episodes prior to this where we had someone else who developed Kit's systems that ended up turning evil? Now Dr. Browning, he's evil as well. So, um, you know, I, apparently, you know, when you work on Night Industries projects, you just want to turn evil. I don't know. All right, so here's a great example of principal photography versus insert shots or insert photography. So we see uh, Lance Burton, Austin Templeton uh, in this scene, and he's actually writing Devin's name on here, right? So he wrote Devin, Miles, and a slash. And then we see the insert, and it's a completely different piece of paper, right? So uh, it looks like the cards and the pen are pretty much in the same location. And the phone right but the name is different I mean the the writing is different even look at the slash under here you see how it's at an angle that all the gap between the M and the slash but then over here the slash is right up against the S and here you can see it's totally different so again very useless knowledge but you can use it at your next uh, foundation Halloween party Devin is still having those right and we've got the return of Mary Beth Evans, um, who we last saw in season two playing Cindy in White Line Warriors. This is her second and final appearance in the series. And we've got uh, another rare, rare occasion when um, Devin is in kit in the passenger seat. We saw it back in the pilot. We saw it in No Big Thing. When else do we, was there not, there's probably another time that's escaping me, but uh, at least those two. But yeah, we see Devin uh, in kit once again, I think for the last time. Not counting, of course, Knight Rider 2000 when he rides in the Knight 4000. Um, and then we come over to this angle and you can get a great look here at some of the rigging on the door. So um, there's, there's some kind of a rigging here and then there's a hood up here to block the sunlight from getting the car so it doesn't wash out the actor's faces. But that's what all that is right over there. All right, so Michael gets out, asks Kits to pop the trunk. If you look closely, you can see there's a guy in the back seat. There's a pull handle here on the passenger side interior panel. The guy pulls the handle, it pops the trunk. That's how that magic works. All right, so then the hearse attacks uh, Michael and uh, Devin. And uh, a couple interesting things to note. First of all, they had obviously a couple hearses here and the license plates change also as you watch the scene. This one is 9WRB357. You also see 7WDV722, but who's paying attention to those details, right? Um, so take a look at this. All right, so the hearse comes in, misses Michael and Kit, knocks out this planter surround, and then leaves. All right, so... We're going to fast forward here. Um, we'll get to this scene here in a minute, but I want to show you this. So Michael and Kit, after the whole hearse scene, come back. And they couldn't have been gone very long, but look at this. In the short amount of time during that chase and him coming back, you already have people from the hotel coming out. They cleaned up the old box. And they've got a new one in here. They're about to put the tree in it. So that's a pretty attentive staff there at the uh, Ambassador Hotel, I must say. All right, so next up we have what will become the final ski mode of the series right here where Kit skis between these two cars while the uh, hearse gets away. If you look in the background here, we see some of the Knight Rider crew members. Uh, looks like they're filming. I think that's the camera right there. And, um, and we've got two crew members here, one crew member here. But I'm pretty sure that's the camera that's going to capture not this angle, but the next one we're going to see. This is the general purpose T-top stunt car, the one that was introduced in season three. Kind of rare we see the underside of Kit this late in the series. 
Um, back in the beginning, in season one, a lot of those early episodes, when you'd see ski mode, they'd actually show you the underside of Kit, and Kit would look pretty much like a factory Trans Am. It wasn't until a little bit later in the series that they tried to hide Kit's underside. The episode that comes to mind the most is Night of the Drones, right? Whenever a kid is destroyed, lands on his side, we see Michael come up to him, and they've covered the entire body underside of Kit with uh, like sheet metal or something so you don't see anything. But um, here they didn't seem to really care about that. What do we see here? Um, pretty much a stock Trans Am except for the skid plate, dual resonator exhaust. Um, we know this is one of the train wreck cars, so this is a 1983 Trans Am. Um, but other than that, uh, under here it all looks pretty much factory. So let's go ahead. So this is the, the camera that I just showed you a couple screenshots ago. This is what they were filming here. And you get a better look at the skid plate here. You see the bar that they welded into the, um, uh, the frame or the unibody here and it bolts up here. And then there's some additional mounting points in the back. Um, you see the orange Coney shocks that they added to all of the Knight Rider cars, at least all the ones that um, we've been able to see. Um, that was kind of an across the board change. And take a look at this. This is interesting. So um, you see the air or the uh, oil filter. Um, it's orange. It's most likely a Fram oil filter, right? Fram has been around for decades. They're orange. So when we acquired. Um, our second original Knight Rider car. Now, for those of you um, who need a refresher, the second car we got um, after the show ended, it ended up being a static display for decades. So, and it, it didn't run. They actually took the gas tank out of it to put it on display. So we know that that car didn't run since pretty much its Knight Rider days. Um, What's interesting is whenever I got under there and, you know, I did the routine maintenance before firing it up, one of the things I did obviously was change the oil and change the filter. Well, it still had an old, old style Fram air filter. You could tell that it was an older one. Um, it still had the Fram oil filter. It looked just like this one. It was orange. So, um, you know, I think I've got the original oil filter from its Knight Rider days. <laughs> um, of course, it's saved in a box somewhere. But um, just, just a neat little aside there on an oil filter. Who have thought we'd be talking about an oil filter today? Um, anything else? Okay, and then the car comes back down for a landing. This is Buzz Bundy driving. He did all the skiing on the show. And you can see his bar here. We've talked about this bar many times in the past. This is the bar they added to the car temporarily. So whenever Buzz was up on two wheels, he'd be able to grab hold of the bar and kind of keep himself in the seat. All right, so the chase is on. There's the hearse. Um, but what I'm most interested in is this moving and storage truck right here. So um, to most, you know, you wouldn't even notice this. But this design, I recognize. First, I thought it was the same moving truck we saw in Diamonds on a Girl's Best Friend that kind of broke up the, the chase that Michael was on in that episode. But I went back and looked. And no, it's a different moving and storage truck. So then I got to thinking, where else did we see? I know I've seen this moving truck somewhere else in the show. And then it hit me. It was in Custom Made Killer. And here's that exact same truck right there. I'm pretty sure this is one of the Universal Studios crew trucks, or was at the time. Uh, this is a GMC Top Kick. Uh, Universal had a contract with GMC, and that's how they acquired a lot of their GMC Astros, their GMC Top Kicks, even the GMC Generals for uh, the Semi. So, and we can see here, this one is blue, just like uh, the one we see here. So I'm pretty sure this is the exact same truck, just reused, but that's definitely part of Universal's fleet. All right, so moving on, um, we're deep in the chase uh, with Kit and the hearse. And this is, um, this was filmed at uh, Magnolia Boulevard in Tahunga. That's the intersection here. And interestingly enough, this is only a couple miles away from where they filmed the big uh, chase in Killer Kit where Michael was on the hood of Kit. But take a look at this. If we look in the background here, just to give you a then and now shot, uh, you see this, this kind of glass building here. It almost looks like a greenhouse, although it looks like there's cars maybe inside of it. I don't know. But um, actually, it says YMCA. Maybe it's in a pool. 
a covered pool. I don't know. But anyways, so take note of that building, note of the YMCA, and let's take a look now. So this is what that intersection looks now. We've got a 7-Eleven, but if we zoom in here, take a look. There's that exact same building today. Has not changed one bit. And if you look, it's still a YMCA, just has a different sign. Isn't that cool? None of that's changed in 40 years. All right, so while we're uh, talking about this whole chase scene, I have something really, really cool to share with you that hasn't been ever published publicly. So um, Lou Race, some of you guys might recognize the name. Some of you guys have met him in person at some of the Knight Rider events over the years. Um, Lou Race was the first assistant director, the first AD of Knight Rider for seasons three and four. So um, he didn't do every single episode. He did like every other episode. He was on with another AD and they would swap do every other episode. So we had the uh, opportunity a number of times over the course of the last few years to meet up with Lou privately and just to hear his stories about working on the show. And uh, it's, it's, it's fascinating. He has such a sharp memory and he saved all of his uh, notes from back in the day. So actually, we did record some of this. So um, a video, you know, we recorded some of our uh, meetings with Lou. So at some point in the future, um, we'd love to get those, you know, in uh, on our channel so you can watch them for yourself. But in the meantime, um, Lou was the first AD of this episode. So um, he provided us some documents. And there's one particular document that I want to share with you that I think you're going to find kind of interesting. This is Lou's original um, notes on the hearse chase. Because if you remember in the episode, there was a real hearse and a real funeral procession, you know, story-wise, not actually, but driving. And then Austin Templeton in the bad hearse comes along and then the uh, the funeral procession gets confused and ends up following Austin Templeton and that whole thing. So um, Lou had to coordinate all that and, and make sure it made sense. So what you're seeing here are his, his uh, notes, you know, on the roads. Here's Chandler Boulevard, Tahunga. Um, and just how the funeral procession is going to work. Like, here's the truck, here's the bad hearse, the good hearse with um, the funeral procession. And you can see here how that truck comes, cuts off the funeral procession from the hearse, and then the other bad hearse, you know, cuts in. So a lot of thought went into this. If you watch that scene after looking at this, it's really, really well done. But he talks about kind of each step and where each piece of this puzzle is going to be and how that funeral procession is going to lose the good hearse and start following the bad hearse. So really, really uh, neat drawing that he did there. So I wanted to share that with you. Alrighty, and uh, next up we see just kind of a blur in the background. We see another GMC top kick. Uh, pretty sure this is also Universal Studios. This is the, the same paint job and everything. This is probably another one of their uh, crew trucks. Alrighty, so now we enter this sequence here where uh, the hearse flips on its side. Um, really, really a well done sequence, and I kind of wanted to take you through it and then show you where it was actually filmed. So if we look here, uh, there's Kit in the background here, the hearse comes, and obviously it's heading right for the camera, right? So we see it come in and land. First, notice all the spectators in the background here and over here watching this unfold. But if you look here, you remember, obviously the camera is going to get destroyed here. It's going to hit this bumper, right? Well, here's the camera right here, the crash camera. And as we follow the sequence, you know, there's the camera. We see the hearse sliding, sliding some more. Come to the front. There's the crash camera right there. And if we look over here, there's a slate marker right there. Um, whoops. And then, so let's go back, and I want to show you something. So if we go back to this scene, um, see this building in the background, this Sergio, it's red brick. Um, it's got these square glass pane windows and looks like a uh, maybe an addition on the back. So this was over on Chandler Boulevard, and that building is still there today. It's not painted black, but this is that same building. There's that extension. So if we rotate around, we can see this is where that action took place. So going back over here, we can see that the road is over here. There's a, a sidewalk, some grass, and then a little parking area with some big trees. So that's this right here. So the hearse flipped right over this berm 
and over into this area. So if we come down here a little bit, let's see. Actually, I think I think the flip happened further down this way, if I um, were to guess. I think the, the lenses are playing tricks on us because if we look here, we can see that it's coming up. There's a building right here and all these big trees. And I'm pretty sure that's this building right here. In fact, if you look, there's uh, some of those trees right here are still in place today. Um, and see, then we cut over here and you, you see the uh, red brick building with that extension in the back. This is actually the North Hollywood Senior Citizen Center. How about that? So that's where uh, the funeral, uh, the, not the funeral, the hearse uh, ended its, its uh, run there. But um, yeah, there you go. All still there today. Alrighty, so we're back at the Ambassador Hotel, and a couple things to note here. First of all, there's one of the University Studios crew trucks in the background, the uh, Comtron trucks, as we call them. And, of course, the Flag Semi is here. This is, um, you know, the Flag Semi you think was used, like, in 90% of the episodes. But in reality, most of that was... Um, I guess you could say stock footage. What they would do at the beginning of each season, um, or maybe not the beginning, if there was ever a break in filming, which there were throughout either either during the summer or maybe a couple week break during the filming season, um, the second unit would would go out, and they would take the semi and they would film. They would take the semi, they take Kit, and they'd film like generic drive by shots of Kit. They'd film uh, Kit going in and out of the semi, all that stuff. So they'd have this bank. Of footage that they could use anytime they needed they needed to so even though it seems like the semi was used in like almost all the episodes in reality it was probably used in like a dozen episodes and that's one of the things that um, we're doing especially now that we have the semi in our possession um, is going through and seeing exactly what episodes was the semi actually on set for not just um, used in stock footage so um, we'll probably cover that in a future video I think all right, so moving on, we get this great shot. You know, Kit's talking to that blonde woman that uh, comes up to him. And um, we get this great shot of Kit's voice box, not from straight on, but from the side. Now, why is that important? Well, maybe it's not important, but I'm going to share it with you anyways. Um, really, we never see Kit's voice box filmed from this angle, like ever. Um, in... The beginning of the third season in Knights of the Fast Lane, we do see some shots of the speedometer and tack board uh, filmed from the side. But really, the only other time we saw Kit's voice box from this angle was way back at the beginning of season one. We saw it in the pilot, and we saw it um, some in Deadly Maneuvers. I don't know if we saw it Inside Out or not. I don't think we did. But um, other than that, it's always just filmed, been filmed straight ahead. So it's really cool to kind of see the dash from this angle. And you can really appreciate a little bit more all the lines of the dash and the curves and just how great really this, this dash was designed. All right, so I'm pretty sure this scene, this is supposed to be Austin Templeton's warehouse, pretty sure this scene was filmed at Universal Studios. This building looks a heck of a lot like the color scheme that the stages had back then and this looks like a parking garage maybe see how there's that there's a uh, one of those uh clearance beams right there that almost looks like a parking garage so i'm wondering i don't know for sure i'm wondering if that's this is at universe studios wondering if this is that this is a parking garage you can see all the the s spots here and actually this garage was used in um the topaz connection right after you know um Oh, what's his name? I can't think of his name. Was shot at the beginning, and then Michael jumps in kit, drives up a parking garage, and loses him. That's this parking garage. So I'm wondering if that's the scene uh, from Deadly Nightshade was filmed right here. It was one of these buildings, or these might be newer buildings. There might, I think there were stages there at one point, but I think that's where this was filmed. Could be wrong. All right, so we move on. We've got uh, Austin Templeton, Lance Burton, coming out of Kit's trunk. This is the uh, the general-purpose T-top stunt car. Yes, there's a real tiger in the car. Um, 
we when we talked to Lance years ago, he told us about um, how he was a little scared uh, he, of this of the tiger in the scene because he walked by the tiger and it swatted at him. So that left him a little bit uneasy. But fortunately, there were uh, no injuries on set. So the tiger gets out of the car, and we get a good look here at the round stunt wheel of the car. And if we move ahead, we can also see the uh, there's no lower console, just the uh, factory Trans Am power window switches. And uh, so the tiger gets out and then comes back later and walks all over the hood. Now, if you watch this scene, watch the scene where the tiger puts his paw right on Kit's hood scoop because he, there's a noticeable dent. He definitely pushes it down. And in fact, in the documents we got from Lou Race, it talks specifically about how the hood of this car was damaged when the tiger walked on it. So it needed to be replaced. All right, and like we said earlier, um, we do see Super Pursuit in mode at night, one of only two times in the series we see it. The other time was in uh, Night Behind Bars earlier in the series, in the season. But um, the car was not actually used. The Super Pursuit mode car was not actually used. This is all reused footage from Night Behind Bars. All right, so we close out the episode. We've got Hasselhoff on the left-hand blind drive car doing some magic. Um, I think I might have mentioned this before, but anytime you see this overhead console with this dip in the middle, see how it's bowed and you can see some of the headliner? That's pretty much a giveaway. It's a left-hand blind drive car. And especially if you see the car from further away and it's driving by itself, it's definitely the left-hand blind drive car. All right, guys, that concludes our coverage of Deadly Nightshade. I am so happy to be done with this one since I had to record it. Not once, not twice, but three times. But this is the sacrifice I do for you guys, the Knight Rider fans. Um, so next up, we've got Redemption of a Champion. Is that a great episode? Is it a terrible episode? You can let me know. I have my own opinions, which I'll probably voice in that, uh, in that commentary coming up. As always, thanks so much for spending some of your day with me. I really appreciate it, and we'll talk to you soon.